Not all spears are built the same. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So, um, fairly simple video here, but really to point out that spears obviously come in lots of different varieties. Now, that seems like an incredibly simple thing to state. Clearly, if we think about all the different types of North American, South American, African, Asian, European spears throughout history, of course, and prehistory, of course, there's a huge, huge variety of materials, shapes, sizes, lengths, everything else. But even if we just look at the medieval period, um, I think a lot of people don't appreciate how varied spears could be. Now, I'm, this isn't going to be an overview of types of spears or anything like that. Far, far more simple than that. So, quite simply, what I've got here is a type of spear that you might find in the early medieval period, the uh, so-called Dark Ages, and you'll notice that it has a fairly thin blade, um, somewhat really like the end of a, of a sword blade or, or, or kind of like a knife. Um, so very uh, relatively thin, it's double-edged, most spears are, not all of them, but most are. Um, and if we look at the um, blade here, this is made by Paul Binns incidentally, and he specialises in sort of Viking era and Anglo-Saxon. Uh, blades and spears, weapons of various types. And you'll notice that the blade is relatively thin and of course it's kind of leaf shaped. Now this type of spear is fantastic for stabbing into things and causing a huge amount of blood loss and it will penetrate fairly easily um, and, uh, and get the job done. But what it's quite poor against is armour. Now it's not to say it's useless against armour, any pointy object is useful against armour. However, this is not really optimal against armour at all. And even a male shirt of Bernie, as uh, mentioned in Beowulf or anything that we might see in like the Bayer tapestry or any of that Carolingian Frankish art that we see, anything from that period really um, that is uh, male, a male shirt, and even certain other types of armour that may, have more, may not have been around at that time as well, um, would have been a problem for this type of spear. They would have been a problem for most of the other weapons of that period, but you've got to bear in mind that armour wasn't necessarily incredibly prevalent until you get to about 1000 AD. So this type of spear is actually not very well optimised to deal with armour. But in this period, in the Viking era for example, we do find certain types of spearhead which are more rondel dagger like frankly they're more like a spike so they have less uh, blade on them and they're going to cause less uh, they'll be less useful as hunting spears for example they're going to cause less blood loss less tissue damage but they are better for getting through a male shirt now if we fast forward to the age of plate you'll all be familiar through my channel and others when we talk about particularly swords but even if we're talking about things like axes and pole axes and war hammers and things like that that weapons had to evolve to deal with plate armor. Plate armor forms all sorts of challenges for weapons. Number one, conventional weapons basically can't get through plate armor very easily. They can sometimes, depending where the plates are and how good the quality of the plates are and things like that. But generally you're looking for gaps in armor. So if we look at the treatises for the use of weapons in the age of plate armor, it's mostly about bypassing the armor, either wrestling the person, uh, getting them into a clinch, a grapple, opening their visor, cutting the straps, stabbing into gaps, armpits, groin, any facial openings, inside of the elbow, this kind of stuff. Okay, so it's about bypassing the armour. However, some weapons can directly oppose armour and we also have to accept that whether you're trying to find those gaps or defeat the armoured opponent in the most efficient way, this spear will intentionally or unintentionally hit armour. Now if this type of spear was repeatedly hitting plate armour, for example helmets or breastplates, but even pauldrons and folds and things like this, this blade will get damaged quite quickly. Also remember that this is modern steel, modern heat treatment, very good quality steel by medieval standards. With a medieval steel, which is slaggy, contains more imperfection, more impurities and um, byproducts of the manufacture of the steel itself, it's more likely to fail in use. Okay, So this type of spear is suboptimal, number one for getting through or between armour, but also it's also suboptimal in terms of standing up to the world where lots of people are wearing armour. And it doesn't have to be a knight's full plate harness, it could be a common soldier's brigandine and male shirt with a sallet on top, so even regular soldiers at this time are still wearing lots of armour. So what's the solution? Well I'm going to show you, but before I do, 
I just want to also mention the shaft. Now, I love to mention my shaft on this channel, um, both in terms of its length and its girth. This is a fairly long spear. I'll get back so you can get a sense of its uh, size. It's what is that? I don't know, like eight and a half feet long, something like that. So it's a, you know, it's a fairly typical length for a spear. And this is a fairly wieldable um, and fairly nimble and light object. Okay, you can see that the shaft is not particularly thick on, on, on my weapon here, but um, it feels nice in my hand. It's good and nimble and there's no particular reason, certainly in the Anglo-Saxon or Viking era, for this particularly to have a um, either a longer shaft or a thicker shaft. This will do the job. This is just about right. This is what I can optimally use for potentially throwing but using with a shield, uh, quite wieldable. Um, I can use underarm or, un, um, or overarm as we've seen um, and like, as I say I can throw it fairly easily. So it's a good size. It's thick enough and strong enough for the job. However, we've talked about the heads. In the age of plate, things change. This becomes more of an object that you're using in two hands, either way around. Also, it becomes an object that's being used as a lever, as a wrestling lever. So I might be using it to try and hook behind people's legs. I might be using it um, if I've come in close to get over their helmet to come in to throw them. Um, so this becomes almost like a quarter staff in the 14th and 15th centuries and indeed on into the 16th centuries this becomes almost like a quarter staff which needs a more robust tip so what do we end up with well not to say that spears like this disappeared they did still have a purpose however what we often end up with instead is something more like this okay now first thing to mention is this is a blunt one, again made by Paul Bins, and this is made for reenactment purpose. So you have to imagine this point continued here. But the rest of the shaft, uh, sorry, the rest of the head is pretty much the same shape. And it just so happens I have a sharp one over here. These are essentially, this one's a bit bigger, but these are essentially the same type of spearhead. And this was what was being used in the 14th and 15th centuries. So you'll notice this one, it's just like it's had the point chopped off because as I say, it's for reenactment purposes, so it needs a reenactment safe tip. So it's a different style of blade. It looks a different shape from that direction. But what's most noticeable is if you look from this direction. And funnily enough, the chopped off tip actually might make it easier for you to see. Let's see if I can get the camera to focus on the tip. There we go. So you can see it is almost square section up here by virtue of these very strong ribs. I'll just put this spear down for a second and we'll just look at this sharp version with the spearhead. You can see it's got a very strong midrib up here. So it's very, very, very thick. So this tip, much like many rondel daggers or the tips for uh, pole axes, for example, or war hammers, this is square up here. So it's very reinforced. It's like an arrowhead of this period as well. So it's square, it's strong, very rigid blade, um, less suited to, I mean, this, these, it's got very thick um, blades essentially here. So this is really, this is really a specialized stabbing implement. Now, not only does this slightly increase its chances of going through certain types of armor, probably increases its chances of going through a male shirt or a male armpit in armor, Probably also increases its chances of going through things like a brigandine or a lamella, potentially. But perhaps most importantly, it means it's stronger. Just grab the other spear for a second. Whereas this blade is more likely to get bent or broken or compromised in some other way, jamming into armour repeatedly, this blade will not. Yes, it might potentially curl or slightly blunt on the tip, but the blade as a whole is going to remain in one piece and is going to have to, is going to be able to sustain crashing into helmets and breastplates repeatedly. But that's not where the special adaptation ends. It's not just a thicker blade of a different shape. Also now look at the socket. So number one, it is made for a thicker shaft and we'll talk about the thickness of my shaft in a second should be legendary by now I would think but if you look at the length of that socket and the style of that socket it is a much stronger 
much more robust type of socket with a thick neck. If we, if I just put that down for a second, if we look at the earlier style spear, it's got a thinner neck up here. This actually has a, a, an open split. Some of them are closed, some of them are open. Get different styles in different areas. That's a detail I won't go into here. Um, but you'll notice that this is just generally a much more slender and longer socket, more likely to be able to comp be compromised if we are using it in levering and pushing and wrestling actions, or indeed, if it's being hit by things like pole axes or bills repeatedly. Now, if we come back to the um, shafted blunt version here, same thing here, we've got a solid socket, and this is made after original examples of the 15th century, a solid socket where the forge weld is hidden. There's no uh, visible split. It's pinned through as they all, all were pretty much, it's pretty much standard universal way of attaching it to the shaft. Um, and you'll notice in some cases, and this goes for the older spears as well, that the shaft actually continues up inside what you think of as the head. So this can be solid or this can be hollow here, but it's a very thick neck. Okay, so just behind the head there, it's, um, it's still very strong, very, very robust, and it's not an overly long socket. Um, and a very, as I say, a very broad and thick socket, and probably the walls of the metal of most of the originals of these tend to be stronger as well. Now, finally coming to the shaft, yes, obviously, this is a thicker shaft as well, and we find that the extreme example is if you look at boar spears of the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, they are super, super thick, almost like a boat oar, um, and that's because they're very, for a very specialized use. But I mean, the other place we can look for thick spears as well is lances. Now, this is a footman's, la um, footman's spear. Um, so this is designed for use on foot. It's actually even slightly longer than the other one. But even though it's quite thick, it's still, you can still see that it's quite nimble because at the end of the day, it's like a quarter staff. You can still move the thing around pretty quickly, even though it's got a very robust steel head on the end and a really robust ash shaft. But this is now thicker, which has several advantages. Number one, it's more rigid, okay, which means in stabbing into targets, it like a breastplate or an opponent's mail shirt underneath the breastplate, it's less likely to flex and more energy is going to go into the target. But also, of course, it's thicker, so it's more able to sustain blows from opponents' uh, heavy weapons like bills or halberds or um, pole axes or swords or whatever. Um, so it's tougher, it's less likely to break, it's less likely to flex. Um, and at a push, you could use this on horseback as what's called a lance gay. A lance gay is a small lance, essentially, so a demi lance. Um, so absolutely, you could you could mount up on a horse, and yeah, it'd be a little bit on the short side. But if you held it right at the back, you could absolutely use this on horseback as a lance if you needed to, and it would be strong enough um, and rigid enough to do that. So the late medieval spear. It's still a pointy stick. It's still basically a sharpened piece of metal on the end of a stick, but there are some subtle changes which make it far more effective to dealing with the heavily armoured environment in which it found itself, and which make it really quite a different weapon in many ways, and even to how it handles and how you can use it, quite a different weapon to its earlier ancestor from the early medieval period. I hope this has been interesting. See you again soon on the channel. I'm Matt Easton. I will still be next time you meet me and I'll see you soon. Cheers, folks.